Today's episode of Bachelor Party is brought to you by State Farm. Like anyone looking for the right match, you want someone you can count on. Someone that's dependable, understanding, someone that'll tell it to you straight. When it comes to insurance, State Farm deserves a rose. They're always there when you need them. File a claim day or night with the State Farm mobile app, which was awarded Best Insurance Mobile App 2019. And they're great listeners. With 19,000 local agents, they get to know the real you, so they'll help you choose coverage that's personal. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Welcome to Bachelor Party. I'm Juliette Littman. Today's guest, a first time, I think, on this podcast. It's Chris Ryan from The Watch. Hi, Juliet. I think this is my first time on Bachelor Party. Well, you don't really watch reality TV. Well, I don't watch Bachelor. And then I think I'm a pretty, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty rare bird when it comes to reality television. But now all of a sudden, with all this time on my hands, I'm, I'm all about taking chances on life. <laughs> Well, I'm really happy you're here today to discuss a show that I genuinely asked you to watch. I didn't think that you would. And now you have. You were watching Top Chef for the first time ever. Yeah. You know, every, everybody had been like, you should, you would really like Top Chef. Uh, my, our buddy Sean Fennessy was like, you know, if you're such a Survivor fan, you know, Top Chef is like in that same sort of band of kind of prestige reality. And it's true. we, my wife and I had just kind of like, I think, we just kind of gotten stopped by the idea that you would be n- not able to try the food. And like, how would you, how would you kind of be able to evaluate someone if you weren't eating what they were cooking? And, uh, you know, we, we just, but because it's in Los Angeles this year and because we're obviously in LA, we decided to give it a shot and I'm glad we did. That is always like the biggest hurdle of Top Chef for people who haven't watched is convincing them that it doesn't matter that you can't taste the food, which right. is, it's, it's funny to me or like, you, you know, you don't even, often even know what they're talking about. Like they use ingredients. You're just like, what is that? Like, I, well, I they also just like about. rip through what the thing is at the end where they're just like, yeah, it's a pear gremolata with a pear creme fresh with a pear <laughs> this. And you're just like, I don't know. That sounds okay. But you just have to rely on the judges and the judges are so fun for the most part, or at least like, even when they're not fun, they're good villains. I have, I have so many questions because I've been watching this show for a really long time. However, I do recall when I was in college, I was like, well, I can't taste the food. Why would I want to watch? Mm-hmm. But this is like, this is like phase one of like, I guess, as you said, prestige reality TV. It came, it came along in 2005 or six mm-hmm. on Bravo, which was certainly not what it is now. Um, it magical elves is the production company. I believe they still make it, but like they, it was at the time when, when basically the three major shows that were not like on MTV or, or survivor, well, that's not true. Basically the three cable ones that weren't on MTV are, were um, top chef project runway and Queer Eye. And mm-hmm. first of all, all of the shows still on Project Runway, basically on two times since Project Runway is back on Bravo and there's Making the Cut. Have you ever heard about that? I haven't watched Making the Cut yet, but I was I was thinking about giving it a shot because I really liked Project Runway in the, in the beginning. It's pretty good. It's like weird. If you're the one of the Project Runway producers, you have to be so pissed because basically like obviously what made that show run early on was Tim and Heidi and, mm-hmm. and Making the Cut. Um, has a lot of Tim and Heidi, but like they also do like interstitials of, of the show of Tim and Heidi just like doing activities together. Like the, <laughs> the most recent episode, they went fencing. It was did they really? Like, yes, they were in Paris and they went fencing. Tim, I remember to- Project Runway was like, I I associate that as much with the time when it used to be like not uncommon to have like watch parties for a bunch of shows. Like people yeah. would come over and watch Lost. People would come over and watch Project Run- Runway. People will come over and watch the Sunday night shows like Mad Men or Breaking Bad or or whatever. So yeah, I, I I almost associate Project Runway with like peak TV or prestige TV, like golden age, as much yeah. as anything else. Yeah. In the aughts. Like came it was it was very early. But anyway, Top Chef, the the barrier is always like, why can't you taste it? But I'm curious why you like Mal and I refer to it as like a perfect show. And I, I still think that it's basically perfect. But I'm curious, like as a TV connoisseur, like what do you think makes it feel prestige and like what makes it makes it successful, like at its core? Well, I think that um it feels adult, you know, yes. like it feels like the people who are there, and it, it's similar to Survivor in this way, is that it's really about the game that they are playing. You get some biographical information and there's some heartstring pulling and it helps to know what 
restaurants these people may or may not have opened or worked at or who they've worked for. But ultimately, it's really about how these people are playing the game that they're uh, given rather than like, let's trash our own lives while we're on camera, which is, I think, the part that of reality TV that I have a hard time with. So I just really think it reminds me a lot of like, it's just an exercise. It's like almost an intellectual exercise to watch it. Right. Like this is one of the shows like Survivor that you wouldn't be embarrassed on. In fact, this is career making, not career mm-hmm. breaking, whereas most reality TV is definitely career breaking. Although, oh, I don't know if it actually is. It's a whole other conversation that we can come back to. But yeah, it's like it, it's sh- it's showcasing skills, right? Like, which is, again, similar to Survivor. You have to both be a really good cook and have like really good fundamentals, but also um like understand like you only have two hours. So like, what can you make in two hours? Like it requires like a lot of strategy. I think it's almost underrated for how much strategy it gets. Or how and much also I think probably like it, it kind of, ha- you can be a really good top chef chef. It seems like, and, or you could be like, you could be bad at top chef, but be a really good chef, I guess is what I'm saying. Like there was one guy in one of the first LA episodes this season who was just like, I just don't do fish. Like I, I don't know how to cook Kevin. Like, yeah, fish and Kevin's pretty good. You know, Kevin and but it's really good. It's kind of like if you're on Survivor and you're Sandra, but you're like, I can't do physical challenges, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I know. And, well, let's talk about Survivor after this, by the way. Why not? Okay. You know, I, yeah. I got you here. Um, <laughs> there's this guy on the show, Brian Malarkey, who was in season three uh, in Miami. He's been pretty good so far this season. He's always been like a character of Top Chef. He's never like seemed like one of the best chefs. Like Brian Voltaggio, as you've probably gathered from these three episodes, is like an amazing chef. Yeah. Um, he, he has not won his brother, Michael won. And he also came in second on top chef masters, but he's like amazing. And ev- everyone knows it. I've been to, I've been to a couple of his restaurants. They're really good. Um, he's from the Maryland area, right? Yeah. He's from Maryland. They're from, they're from Maryland. And I think is, does Michael have restaurants in Philly? I think, uh, he might, I'm not yeah. sure, but he, he definitely might. He's like clearly really good. But this guy, Brian Malarkey, I just learned this from catching up with, Tom, Padma, and Gail on Watch What Happens Live, which is now like a kind of infamous episode because Andy Cohen's coughing on it a lot. And it was oh like right God. before he got sick. It's right, right before he got sick. Brian Malarkey apparently is like the richest person to ever be on Top Chef, including Tom Colicchio and Padma. Um, and it's because he started these two restaurants that you probably know in, in LA. One is Herringbone and the other is called Seersucker. They're both mm-hmm. like in Las Vegas as well. And he sold them. And so he's like really, really rich from making like what I would say is like anywhere from like a mediocre to good restaurant, but it's like a super like California rustic aesthetic. Very pleasant. You're like, yeah, I'll eat here. Why not? Okay. Yeah. Cause there, it's so not it's like, the same. It's not like a Seersucker isn't a chain though. Right. Cause Seersucker, there was a Seersucker in Brooklyn for a while. Yes, Jay Z and Beyonce were noted for eating there. That place closed. It was great. It was okay. in Carroll Gardens. I That's really right. Really good. It was really good. No, this is different. But Herringbone um, is on Ocean. It's close to Shutters, basically. I don't know. It's good. I, okay. I've been to it in Vegas. There's one in La Jolla. But basically, like he, so he's like a really successful commercial chef. But I don't think his skills necessarily translate to Top Chef because he's not like he's not blowing you away with his like master crudo. But he seems to be doing so doing well so far. Yeah. And like, it's interesting that they draw, like sh- there are chefs who have their own restaurants. There are chef who've, chefs who've won James Beard Awards. There are chefs who are private dining chefs who yeah. are like kind of outside of the work in the, lo- the line in a restaurant business. It, Stephanie is like, is a private chef, right? She, yeah. She's a private chef. There's a whole hierarchy. Basically there's like the assistant to the, to the big dogs, like basically Jennifer Carroll, I, I have always thought she's overrated. I've never believed she's that good of a chef, but like she's always been highly rated within the show because she was like Eric Repair's like prodigy yes, or right. Apprentice and that's or why she went number one when they were get, doing the seafood thing in San yeah. Pedro. So, because they were like, oh, she knows seafood so well. Okay. Yeah. So, like, if you're like an apprentice to like one of the like internationally famous chefs, like that's like tier one. Tier two, and this is where a lot of the show's winners come from, like this guy, Gregory. Mm hmm who I can't believe he didn't win. Gregory seems great. Who they're sort of like a smaller regional city, but like best restaurant in their city. So it's like the people from Seattle and Portland and Boston and Austin, yeah. like outside of like the top food destinations. And then there's the third tier, which is the private chef, which is like, they just, it's like then the caterers. So they just like, don't get a lot of credit. And you would think the caterers could shine on the show. Cause they're so often being asked to like make 200 orders in the next hour. And you sure. think a caterer is good at that, but Newsflash, really hard to make catered food good at that, that, that quantity. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Yeah. 
It's just it's just re- really well done. So who do you like so far? Like who are you rooting for? I love Gregory. Um, love I Gregory. actually I like St- I like Stephanie. I thought that the uh, the conversation that she was having with with Kate. I'm sorry, I'm still learning all the names, but like two of the That's other okay. uh, female chefs in the house where they were kind of talking about confidence and like being brazen versus kind of letting stuff get in your head. I thought that like the human moments that they show, I think are really effective, not only just like giving character building, but also like talking about the psychology of doing anything. You know what I mean? There are certain people who are just like, nobody can knock me off my square. I'm just, I have such like incredible self-confidence. And then there are people who are like, shit, like as soon as it started going wrong, I like lost my confidence in the entire project. Like when they're talking about doing a quick fire or something like that. But it's actually like, it translates to like so many different walks of life. It, it is true. Like they, the, the pressure I think is really interesting and they give you a good, good insight into it. Like being it, like the pressure cooker, um, comparison is too spot on, but it does seem like these just really like condensed moments of like, you have to perform and it is applicable to many other like sports or jobs where you just feel so much pressure and like the people who are experts in your field are going to be giving you feedback and they, they do a good job of conveying it for, for some reason. Like I just feel like top chef conveys all these concepts very well. Like it's like, yeah. cause that's, cause that's like all they have is like the concepts of like what makes a good restaurant, like what makes good food. And somehow they have like these top chef values that they just communicate really well. Season after season. I can't like quite put my finger on why. Do you think it's because of the judges? Maybe. I mean, I fucking love Tom Colicchio. Do you like Tom? He's really active on Twitter right now. In fact, I, I had a meet I him. do like Tom. I like I I think that I'm sort of getting used to it. I I think the thing that was actually like it really actually like grabs your attention is that if you're used to judge-based reality shows for me at least, I always associate that with kind of more feel-goody stuff like even though there's the Simon Cowell version of it, there's I'm used to more like this person's dream is coming true and the judge is kind of affirming that like American Idol or The Voice. But on this, it's pretty interesting to see people like Padma kind of just like snuff snuff people out. like Totally, to their face. Like, no, it wasn't good. No, it wasn't good or no, like you can't, you know, you can't make an Indian meal for me. Like I, different things like we've really jumped out and that's, I think an element that a lot of reality shows sort of lack. It's true. They're like, Rejection, but almost like in a dignified way, like telling you you're bad, but this is why. Sure. It's almost like the kind of like culture of accountability stuff, you know, and it's like, (laughs) it's like players, it's like watching athletes get kind of dressed down, but not because they are like, not because the coaches are like, I don't like you as a person. They're just saying like, you did not execute this the way that we wanted you to. It's very Steve Kerr and Draymond Green culture yes. of accountability. Yes. You know, <laughs> got to got to keep them in line. Essentially, every team every team has one. Um, do you feel like the 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 judges are big personalities that drive the show? Like, what's their what's like their level of influence from your perspective? Well, I definitely think that in the first couple episodes of the LA season, I was sort of struck by the amount of luminaries from the culinary world that they had. Yeah, involved. Amazing. And I think it definitely like impacts the cooking. And, you know, you, if you know that you're cooking for Wells Tower or Nancy Silverton or whoever, you're probably um, like really it a- adds an extra element of pressure. I know. And Nancy Silverton, hope she's getting better. Can't yeah, I can't know. believe it. I know. She's got coronavirus. Um, I thought the second episode of this season is like one of the best episodes they've really ever done. The Jonathan Gold and episode, yeah. The Jonathan Gold episode. It was it was so moving. Matt Louis that kind of reminded Alan. me of like the best of like a really good Bourdain episode, the way that they can, like you're talking, like the way they conveyed the values of a food writer through a competition was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was, it was really beautiful. And also there's, I, we're going to talk more about this cause I, I need to tell you about my real housewives obsession, but they, there was a real like profound dissonance in watching that episode um, of top chef where they're going all around LA. And so the challenge is um, if you haven't been watching, which you know, as Jacoby would say, weird. Um, they go all around LA to try out these like these restaurants from Jonathan Gold's list of the 101 best restaurants in LA. And then the challenge is to be inspired and and make something based on wh- what you ate at one of those restaurants. And to people in LA, the list is like the Bible. And a lot of people try to go to all of the different restaurants. And Jonathan Gold's probably, you know, other than Ruth Rachel and Anthony Bourdain, like probably the most important food writer ever. Yeah. Um, 
and his sudden passing was really, the city took really hard and it was an amazing tribute to him. It was an amazing tribute to LA and it was such a keen reminder of what we are not doing right now, which is experiencing cultures unlike our own through food by going to restaurants in our own cities. And, um, just like even seeing them all eat the food together, like at these various restaurants, the communal aspect of traveling to the great, um, Marisco's Jalisco's food truck in downtown LA just for a taco. And yeah, it's such a, I think LA is like just an absolutely amazing food city. I, I don't really think it's up for debate anymore. Um, I'm from New York and I think LA is like, has better food. Um, and it was such a like beautiful testament to the power of food in LA. And it was just so weird to watch while we're all, all at home. No, it, it was like the, the LA is really difficult to feel uh, communal in for me. Like I, I think that it's pretty yes. uh, not isolating or, or anything like, I mean, it can be cause you're in your car a lot, but the thing that I have really grown to love in Los Angeles is the sense of exploration that food gives you the map for. So you yeah. can go find different neighborhoods and go to different streets that you would never normally go down. Like in New York, you can just wander. But in LA, that's so difficult to do by foot. And if you have a like a kind of guide like the Jonathan Gold Guide or just kind of like a sense of what you want, like today I want to eat... Um, Chinese food or today I want to have Mexican food or whatever it is. Like you can go find these different pockets of the city and you can kind of go and make your own Los Angeles out of that. And that was like really heartwarming to watch that. Cause like right now I, I pretty much live on a map of one block. You know, I go, I walk around the block. That's it. It's so, it's really weird watching this season right now because it, they really, Mal and I were complaining in the, after the first episode that they didn't do a good job capturing LA, even though they had like all these dignitaries for the first. Um, so that was the episode. San Pedro episode, right? That yeah. was when they're cooking on the beach. Yeah, yeah. But then, and then the next episode, they did like the best job possible of capturing LA. Yeah, so it's kind I know. of funny. <laughs> <laughs> and and then they go to the Getty Museum for the next episode, which was just like a you know major LA hallmark. Although I thought that that challenge was stupid, and that's the thing that the only like knock against Top Chef. Sometimes the challenges are like too high highfalutin. It's like, does your food really need to look like a certain type of painting? And like, if it does, like, does that matter? Like, yeah, I just it's like, do I, you care if your chef knows what the Rococo style of painting r- means in, in yeah, terms I definitely of, don't. Yeah, I I definitely don't. That was, and that I was feel like, like they were kind of getting sunned a little bit for not necessarily having like a minor in art studies. And it was like, come on, know. You, know, like, you think this is neoclassical? Get out of here. You're yeah, fired. Right. <laughs> no, right. That's like the one knock against it, but it's like in service of going to the Getty Center, right? So sure. I don't, I don't know. It, it, it was, it was, uh, all that food still looks so good. I it just makes me hungry. Does it, when I, when I watch it, I feel like I need to eat dinner usually after watching Top Chef. I'm curious about this is, um, like, obviously, I think that there has been this incredible explosion of um, fluency. Like, people are way more food fluent than they were maybe, like, 15 years ago when, like, I first started going out to restaurants kind of, like, seriously on my own. And, like, even, you know, it's been it's been interesting to hear Dave Chang talk about, like, with the, his fears about the future of the food industry and how we could be going back to, like, the 90s. Because I remember growing up and it was, like, there was a Japanese restaurant and an Italian restaurant. And then there were those kind of, like, mid-tier chains like Chili's. And then every once in a while you would go to, like, a fancy French place. And then there was, like, Chinatown. And that was it in these cities. And the idea of, like, fine American dining was kind of still, like, a very cloudy concept. But I was curious whether or not you thought Top Chef has participated in the uh, homogenization of, like, quote unquote, good food in America. Sure. I think it has a little bit because there's certain like dishes that I think you get at like a fan, like a kind of hip place that like maybe yes. sm- serve, serve small plates. Yeah. Family so style small plates. You. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let me tell you a little then, bit about what we do here. Yeah. And then so. So like, for example, the things on the show that like are kind of joke foods, but are not really jokes are, um, a crudo, a ceviche, um, scallops, like just sort of like these like hip fish foods. And then, and then there's sort of like a real fetishization of like the hardcore meat people like, um, Kevin is Kevin Gillespie, but like also like is really good. And then there's also like a, a real sort of, um, like 
let me show you my playfulness by including some Cheetos and like, let me give you some, yes. yeah. you know, like things like that. So I, I do think so, but I also think it kind of goes both ways because the show after a few seasons had the clout to be like, Oh, actually these are good chefs. And I think Tom being a part of it actually really helped that and kind of gave it like a stamp of approval pretty early on. But so I, I think that you get these chefs who are coming out of those hip restaurants. And I can tell you, cause I've been to so many of them. Like I, yeah. after I watched someone on the show, I'm like, okay, I want to go wherever they are. And so I've been to a lot of Top Chef people's restaurants. Are there good and bad Top Chef seasons or is it pretty uniformly high level? There's, there, you know, I'm sure your pal Andy Greenwald would love to discuss this with you and he's probably going to be mad that he wasn't invited to be a part of this conversation. We're supposed to do food TV next week. So we're like, oh, we're doing are. like food. Yeah, we're going to do some stuff next week. Okay, great. Can't, don't let Andy be underrepresented in this conversation, you know? Um, there's a couple of seasons that I think are acknowledged as particularly good. Las Vegas, um, Charleston. I think Seattle's acknowledged as bad. However, there's a couple of the winner and the runner up from it are really good. Seattle had a really stupid finale where they had to like cut through ice to um, get their ingredients. It was really, it was really stupid. It was just like the terror um, cutting from the ice. <laughs> just kidding. Dark joke. Um, but, uh, yeah, so like there's like probably like a handful of seasons that are acknowledged as really good and really high quality contestants. But like in general, it's just a really solid show. Gail wasn't on last season because she was on maternity leave. There's some seasons that um, um, Emerald was on. And I have to say, like, I was never really a fan of em- Emerald. Bam! Like, I was just not into that <laughs> whole, whole shtick. Emerald on Top Chef is a totally different person. And he's so lovely. He's like a really genuine and like loving and warm character. He's nothing like the bam guy, like at all. So he'll just be a season long judge on some seasons. Yes. So they'll have like a third judge who comes in for like the whole thing. Um, That was a new Orleans season in particular. That was really good, but obviously Emerald's from new Orleans. So it like meant a lot to him. I have to say, like, I never imagined I would have like particularly warm feelings towards Emerald Agassi, but I I really, really (laughs) do. He's like a great, I just think of him as a great guy. It's just a really steady show. And again, like like we were saying, like I kind of never thought about it in this way before, but it is so like concept and values driven. There's not a lot of other TV shows you can say that about where it's like, these are the values we uphold. So is there a lot of like interpersonal drama on the show or is it typically like it's all food and like sometimes there's some arguments, but that's about it. There's sometimes some arguments and like in earlier seasons, there were some more classic villain types like this guy, Elon. And people like that. But no, and there's very few relationships. I can only think of one season off the top of my head where there was like a showmance. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, you know, I love some romance and drama. So it's just a testament to the show that it doesn't have either of that. And I still love it so much. It's just great. Love. Yeah, it's Jeff. almost like a, it seems like it's basically like watching sports. It's like a really reliable it sport. It really is. On that note, let's talk about another really reliable sport, Survivor. But first, let's talk about today's sponsors. I need to tell you about CauseBox. It's a quarterly subscription box curated by women for women that is filled with all sorts of amazing products and brands that are ethical, sustainable, and have a positive mission to give back and make the world better. Each CauseBox comes with six to eight full-size products. You can get everything from skincare to jewelry to homewares and accessories. The last four boxes sold out within days, which I can believe because you can get to over $250 worth of products for only $50. Your box is shipped right to your door for free and opening it makes you feel like you got yourself a huge surprise box of gifts. Cause box is also a perfect gift for moms, sisters, or friends. Each cause box comes with an exclusive magazine that tells the story and the mission behind each product so that when you do give this to your mom or your sister or your friend, they'll know exactly why it's so meaningful. If you want to take me up on this, I have an exclusive discount for you. Go to www.causebox.com slash bachelor. That's C-A-U-S-E-B-O-X.com slash bachelor and use the code bachelor to get your first box for 30% off. As in, you can get your first box worth over $250 for less than $39 plus free shipping. Go check out Causebox right now. You're going to love it. All right, now let's talk Survivor. By the way, if you like Survivor, listen to The Pod is Spoken on Ringer Dish on Thursdays, hosted by Riley McAtee. I was on last week. Chris has been on before. Yeah. I don't know who's going to be on this week. We'll see. But uh, Survivor is essentially like become like the only thing I live for during the week. Oh <laughs> like, well, no, because it's like the only live or not live, but it's the only like weekly event show 
that I can't like afford to be too late on because it gets spoiled some way or another. And I just think that this season, I think the last couple of episodes have kind of come back down to the, to the median a little bit or the mean, but this season has been routinely like absolutely incredible television and really, really incredible gameplay. Um, Yeah. I think that they may have like kind of force fed an edit over the last couple of episodes. Like I think that I can kind of sometimes feel when the, like the editing of a survivor episode is going against what's actually happening within the the realm of the game. So like, I kind of, yeah, like I kind of felt like, um, Wendell, was gonna get voted out and they kind of spent 15 minutes pretending like it could be Adam or it could be Nick. Yeah. Uh, and so it, were you not you were not surprised by Wendell going home last week? Well, I guess I was surprised at Tribal. I just wasn't surprised that he went out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, but I felt like that they like Riley has spoken about this where it was like earlier seasons of Survivor, especially the early seasons of Survivor, were pretty much just like if you had an alliance, you just voted that alliance until you had vanquished your kind of opponents. And now it just seems like there are no alliances, but I do think that ultimately, like it just seemed like Wendell didn't have the numbers and was going to get voted out. And it, and they just tried to make a big deal out of that. I was a little disappointed that Rob didn't come back uh, just Me because too. I think he's I, incredible television, but Tyson's pretty good television too. I'm not a Tyson fan. I never have been. I find his shtick really annoying. I'm just like, what's your deal, dude? Like, what are you deflecting? Like, just why are you <laughs> like, what do you need to use your humor for? What's really going on here? Yeah, I understand you're like, you know, you, you stand out physically. You're very tall. You're very blonde. You're just a very unique specimen. I get it. But like, I just don't care for his humor and jokes. It just doesn't doesn't work for me. I don't know. He's not for me. Yeah, it was such like a, you know, that was like, I wonder if the CBS folks were like, God, if this ball had gone one different way, we get Rob back in the game. I know. I was really into Yule back in the day, so I was sad it didn't come back, but it, time yeah. has passed Yule by. I'm, I'm I mean, sorry. there's a there's an argument to be made that like that that exile tribe is the most interesting tribe on the, the, the tribe on edge of extinction is the most interesting tribe remaining. Oh, definitely. And I didn't, Riley told me this. I didn't know that we will see, like, they're not all out. Like, they all still could get back. I, I just feel like if I'm Natalie, how am I not back in this game? I mean, she was. But she also has been, to like, dominate. stacking tokens. Like, I think that it, the tokens thing is going to be really, really big because I feel like people were, like, holding on to them because they were thinking maybe that they'll turn into some sort of, like, leverage point to get back in the game. And I know yeah. that we just had the merge, so we'll see what happens next week. But, or this coming week, but I feel like pretty soon people have to start spending their tokens. I know, because like, what are they for? Don't tell me, I, like, at the end of every episode, it gets a little old seeing them just drop them into a little container. I'm like, okay. Yeah, or cool. like, I, doesn't Natalie have like three or four now? Like, because she got, I think she she found tokens yeah, for the first few weeks that she, w- or the first few episodes that she was on Extinction. So yeah. Yeah, and then um, Rob has many as well. Yeah, I mean, this is just like, it's like, uh, I feel like it it really scratches the itch that sports str- scratched for me, which was just like watching this competition, but watching specifically like really elite players. I was really, really psyched to not have to go through three episodes of getting to know you, three episodes of like, I'm just freaking out because I'm on the island. Like you can tell everybody there is like, even the people who are really suffering, like say, like Ethan or or Sophie was obviously like really dealing with the the elements last week. But they are obviously such good players that it has kind of removed an entire um, kind of perfunctory layer of the show. And it's just yeah. like pure survivor now. There's a, I do miss a little bit of people figuring out how to play. There's no sure. sort of like, oh, now I get it. Like, there's no like, you can't be slow to the uptake as you get voted out. But also everyone just comes in with so much knowledge. That's the kind of funny thing about reality shows these days, just in general. And I've been thinking about like old reality quite a bit. It used to like be a level of naivete and like even with a show like The Circle or Love is Blind, like 
as just a basic human in the world, you are familiar with the concept of reality TV and like how sure. it's exploitative one way or the other, or like how you have to reveal yourself one way or the other. And so there's just no, there's so few shows. I, I can't really think of one right away where like the person does not know what they're getting into in any regard and has like yeah. no sense of like what the consequences could be. And so like in Survivor, where I used to say it was the only show you could go on and you could still go back to your job afterwards. It like wasn't embarrassing. <laughs> there's, like, like there's still no, there, there's like, every person on it is still familiar in some sense of, of survivor, particularly because also as like a, um, archetype of a show, it's been applied to so many other ones. And even when I, even when I used to play a uh, flip cup in college, we used to play survivor style where then you have to vote someone off. If you, if your team lost, Oh until wow. only one person left. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> who did you model your flip cup survivor style after? I was really, I was just really, I was at the weakest link. You're out. I'm sorry. And I was very good at flip cup. So <laughs> I love playing a survivor flip cup, but like just the idea of survivor has been applied to so many things. Like even on the bachelor, when people go home, you haven't been voted out, but still it's like, Oh, they got voted out. They got sent home. How do you feel about a guy like Adam, who I think is probably viewed negatively generally by like the average survivor viewer, but is kind of being punished for playing survivor. I think that's a social game thing because Sur- Sophie is also playing Survivor and no one seems to be like ridiculing her or like yeah. talking about her and she's not getting like an annoying edit. Adam just must be really annoying to be around is my take. And I think him. it's also like tough because Adam is m- some, at least in the edit, being paired with Ben. And Who also seems to suck. And is essentially like a chaotic force and Ben is like really a live wire where Sophie's paired with Sarah and they just seem like Butch and Sundance. My issue, my issue if I were to be on Survivor is that I have like no patience for people I dislike and moreover, I don't respect. And so like with someone like Ben and Adam, I would just be such, I would be such a bitch to them. I would be like, oh, whatever that I I would then get voted out because it would be so obvious. I I think I would be all time bad at Survivor. I have very little tolerance for discomfort like in any way. How do you think I would do? Um, I, you're pretty scary when you're hungry. So I think it would be tough. (laughs) Like when you need to go get a salad, I'm like, okay, why don't you go? Like, I would be, I would, I would have like a strong start while I was still like, I was still doing okay in the, in the appetite department. And then I think as soon as we like bottomed out on that, I would be bad. I also get sunburned really easily. Me too. Yesterday I went for a socially distanced walk and it was overcast and I got like very, a lot of sun. Um, I also think that you would just have like one outburst and then that would be a wrap on you. I, I'm actually surprised. <laughs> that there aren't more outbursts on the show. Like, why don't people yell at each other? Yeah, I'm pretty surprised too, I guess. Well, for this season, I would imagine, like, even if you did do an outburst, you could just turn around, like, remember, like, you could just turn around and be like, this this is like, I'm playing a part, you know? Like, you didn't right. get get it. But, like, my whole meltdown was part of, like, a grand scheme. But, yeah, I, yeah. I think I probably, if I snapped, that would be a wrap for me. And you definitely would. It's not if, it'd be when. So, it would be it would be rough. <laughs> um, Chris, can I tell you about my main interest right now in, in quarantine? Yes. Other than that, I started watching Ozark and I'm intrigued to know that you think I could get skip season two. Should I? Um, I just, I want you so desperately to get to season three because it's the best season of the show. Season one has been great. I've, I've got the finale to go. I really yeah. into it. I also like it because it's, um, there's like a lot happening. So if you're bored with one storyline, you don't have to like, they don't commit to it too hard, which I really appreciate. They, they keep it moving. Lots of characters. It's good. Yeah, it's 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 like excellently made television in that regard. Because like you don't, if it's exactly right. If you're like, I'm kind of out on Darlene or something, like it just keeps it moving. The FBI guy who maybe is not even on the show anymore. I had like no interest in him, but luckily he's not on it very much. He's just like, he kind of looks like um uh, poor man's Kyle McLaughlin to me. Oh yeah, that's a good, good comp. Thanks. Kind of like a working working man, Sam Rockwell, a little bit, you know? Yeah. So last night I was watching Ozark and I was like, ah, I'm ready to like take it down a notch. And I went back to my safe space, The Real Housewives of New York City, season three. And season three is a sad one because Jill and Bethany have broken up and Bethany is, uh, they're as like friends. And Bethany has just started dating, dating Jason Hoppy, who has basically been like tormenting her for the subsequent like 10 years. And they were married for a short <laughs> time. And <laughs> there's... I just, I just want to like talk to you about this. I feel I need to like work through it in some, some capacity. Sure. So 
I'm currently in New York, which is the epicenter in America of the coronavirus pandemic. And you like can't really go outside very long, et cetera. Everyone knows. And yet I have like this sick fixation with watching old Real Housewives of New York. And there's this episode in season two, which is like kind of famous, where Kelly Ben Simone, who was a a short lived housewife, she runs through the street. Literally, she's running. She's like the best part of being in New York. She said the best part of of running is the freedom of luxury because you can just put on your sneakers and go. And then Mm -hmm. she has this line about how and then they show her running down Fifth Avenue in the 50s, close to Trump Tower, literally in the street with a taxi cab behind her. And she's like very upright as a gazelle, very like (laughs) flamboyant jogging in the street for the cameras. People are just clearly looking on like, what is wrong with you? And she was like, my favorite thing to do is run in the traffic to be in the traffic trenches. And the other night I was like, kind of, I was like about to fall out, fall asleep. And this played and it like, just like jogged me into this, like no pun intended, this like very alert state. Cause I was like, it's so weird. She's like joking about the traffic trenches when everyone's talking about New York, like it's some kind of like war zone right now because of how many people are dying and what the, you know, healthcare providers are going through. And it's so weird to like be living in the same city that I'm watching an older version of. And also it was filmed during the 2008 recession, the summer of 2008. And so there's just like so much going on here that I just felt like I needed to talk about it on a podcast with you. And it's, it's honestly just like, it's this very surreal experience where I feel like people used to turn to books to understand like what was going on by a similar situation or something historical that had the same precedent. And it's just very weird to think that like, now that we are, you know, 20 years into this reality TV craze, that there's old shows that can provide some kind of frame of reference, even if it's like the polar opposite of what's happening. My wife and I were just having the same conversation about Sex in the City the other day and about how early Sex in the City, because they, they kind of cover 9-11 on Sex in the City at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, the, it's Is very, that Fleet Week very in the middle. Yeah. It's very in the middle because the show ended in 04 and it was six seasons. So it's like season three or four. Season four. Yeah. And I think they, and they, and there's like a whole, like, she's like, she dates, like, she's like, my boyfriend is New York. Yeah. Um, But we were talking about how, like, that show can be weirdly comforting in two ways. One, because if you repeat watch it, it's just kind of like on in the background. And then the other way is that it just gives you this glimpse to the city that is very recognizable, but very different. Yeah, it's it's really weird. And it's also it, the recession part of it is really funny, too, because I don't really remember people on television talking about the recession. Like, obviously, The Good Wife was born out of the Elliot Spitzer situation and Rescue Me was like a post 9-11 show. Mm-hmm. But this Real Housewives of New York is like, you know, like a six month lag between when they film it, when they show it. And like Bethany and Jill both refer to the recession. Bethany's like talking about how she only has one Halloween costume this year <laughs> instead of four. She is like, it's the recession. I'm only going to have one costume. Who do you think I am? Jill Zarin. And it's just like this really weird and I wouldn't say like intense experience because I'm really enjoying it. I find it comforting. It's almost like very comforting to go back and look at the way things were, you know, as recently as three months ago, if not 10 years ago, to be like, oh, right, things will go back to normal. And I feel like this is sounds like a really heavy conversation. I don't I don't mean it to be. I just think that like everyone is like finding these safe spaces and it through television right now of things that are familiar and comfortable. And it's just funny that there's like such an archive of reality TV now that you're able to like revisit a very specific point in time that may or may not have reflected any part of your life. But as a result of it being a popular show reminds you of like a certain time, like with Jersey Shore that was came out in like December 2009 and that was like a whole new wave of things. It's just, it's just really weird. I don't know. It's just, it's funny that like reality TV is actually a real distortion of reality, but is serving a purpose of like reminding me of previous times right now. Well, it's, I think that there's something to be said for the location shooting, you know? And I think that the fact that reality TV in a lot of ways functions as like the way that like run and gun independent cinema did at some points in uh, in American movie history where they could just kind of go out into the streets and kind of make a movie like Jim Jarmusch would just make a New York movie or a New Orleans movie on the cheap. Um, When you watch TV now, I was going to talk about this with Andy today, actually, in relation to the show 000 that's on Amazon. When you watch TV now, like it's pretty routine for it to just feel very samey in terms of its location because people are shooting in new Orleans or they're shooting in Atlanta or they're shooting in New Mexico. Vancouver is a big one too. Yeah. And then there's studio lots 
And so you just kind of get used to like seeing these same images. And while I'm sure there's a lot of similar repeat settings in reality television, the entire premise of reality TV seems to be based on like putting these people in different situations. And if they're in a city, like making them go do stuff, it goes back to the same top chef thing we were talking about. Like you can live your life in Los Angeles and never really leave your house or never really leave your neighborhood, but it's a lot more exciting to try and explore it a little bit. I, it, it's funny that, oh, do you think that re watching real housewives now, after you've obviously already been watching it for, for a long time, since the beginning, like, man. Do you get that same sense that you did where you start thinking about it in terms of this? I'm watching this show before this show became self-aware. Yeah. I mean, with with the women, the housewives in seasons one and two, it's funny. Like you said about like the locations, it used to be easier to get a location approved, right? Like you used to be able to shoot many more places, but now owners of restaurants and event spaces like know what they're getting into and they won't sign the release and they won't they won't let you in so they were like they used to they used to be able to go more places like even to fashion week i don't think fashion week proper is like ever on the show anymore but that's like a part of the early seasons of the real housewives but also um it's funny like watching bethany because she is so famous like you know who bethany is and sure. you don't watch the real housewives bethany very clearly for like seasons one and two is like I'm going to have a lifestyle brand. I'm a natural chef. This is what I do. It's called skinny girl. I will get married or I will become a mother with a guy or not. I don't know, but like, I will do these things. And she's done all of them. And she was right. She didn't stay married. Like, it's just crazy. She was like, this is who I'm going to be. Like, this is what I want. And she got after it immediately. And it's really weird. Like someone see someone like lay out their goals and then like, just do it like that. Um, I guess like, except for like Donald Trump, who was like, <laughs> I'll show you Judd Apatow and Barack Obama. I can be president. Like, stuff, yeah, like, thanks stuff a lot. Like, that. like yeah. yeah, thanks. But like, it's really, it's really weird to see that. And also they just like, they just do really, they say really like obnoxious things. They probably wouldn't say anymore without like some air of it being a joke, but like, they think that they're like really fancy and cool. And it's, it's just totally, it's great. I, I have to say, like, if you have any interest in reality TV, I find going back and watching old seasons of the, of these shows right now, really soothing because it's just like a, it feels so low stakes, but also like funny. It's just, do I you find it. that, do, are you kind of like completely removed from the, any kind of, I am anticipating what happens next. So you're just kind of like, like, can you watch it already knowing what happens? It doesn't take it oh, away, yeah. from, take away from it. Part of what's so great about the Real Housewives of New York in particular is there's a lot of small moments. And actually, really tragically, the um, longtime editor of the show passed away from coronavirus. And it is an excellently edited show. Um, and there were just, like, these small details that were really impressive that were just, like, the, before the women were in on it, the show was in on it. And, like, mm -hmm. making fun of their, um, like, what they were, like, wearing and all this stuff. So Sure. It's just really weird. Have you been watching anything that you feel like you wouldn't watch outside of these circumstances? Um, I think I'm going on a little bit of like a, a, a run of like daffy British mysteries. So mm -hmm. my wife and I are watching The Stranger, which is... I watched it. Recommend. Yeah, based on a Harlan Coben novel, I guess. Uh, and that starts Richard Armitage. And it's really, really twisty and kind of soapy, but also like very, very like compelling and addictive and i've been like kind of looking over trying to find like other stuff like that so you know like there are like these these services like acorn and britbox where you can kind of like peruse and it's so funny because like it'll it'll you'll just like be like come across something and i was looking at this show called jack irish which oh, is yes. this guy pierce show from australia where he plays a pi and i'm like a really big guy pierce fan I had never heard of that. It's got three seasons and three movies. <laughs> I was like, um, what the fuck? I'm going to put you in touch with my mom, my friend Catherine, both of whom are major Acorn and BritBox users. Like just, they watch literally everything on the service, on the service. It's cr crazy. Yeah. So like, there's I'm like a watch, David, Yeah. there's a David Tennant and Cush Jumbo show. That's like four <laughs> episodes called Deadwater Fell. And it's like, I think it's a little bit darker, but it, I was like, I'm I'm probably gonna watch I'm gonna watch this, you know, like I'll watch it. there's something like where it's like when it's set in a small British village, it's just five times easier to watch. Oh my goodness. There's like so much for you to dive into too, because there's just like basically an unlimited number of small British city murder mystery. Like just an unlimited number. I'm excited yeah. for you, Chris. You've got a lot ahead of you on on Britbox and Acorn. Um Thank you so much for joining me. How would you say your first bachelor party experience was? I, I could do it any, anytime you want.
Well, I'll come back and talk more about Top Chef. Yeah, I gotta watch more reality television. That would help. <laughs> I don't see you getting into the housewives, but you know, who knows where, where this life will take you. <laughs> I got nothing but time. Uh, thanks so much for listening. I'll be back on Wednesday with Jacoby. We're doing Challenge and Vanderpump. And uh, I'll talk to you then. Thanks so much, Chris. Check him out on the watch. Bye, buddy. <laughs>